Okay, our next topic for chapter one, a little bit about microbes in history. And, uh, you know, read through this section in your textbook. It'll give you a, a bit of an overview of, of the history of microbiology. You know, we really haven't known that microorganisms were involved in, in human health in any way until not all that long ago. It was the late, uh, late 1800s, not 1900s, before that was realized. I want to start off with, now you're going to have online lab activities that deal with microscopy. And just a little bit of a history about uh, the very first microscope. Obviously, microscopes are really, really important to uh, the study of microbiology, and we will be learning more about how they work when we get into chapter two. And again, also in your uh, online lab activities, you'll be learning some of these th things as well. So who made the very first microscope? It was actually a very eccentric, kind of strange guy named Antony van Leeuwenhoek. He was, uh, lived in the Netherlands, and he was a tailor, a merchant, you know, one of these multitasking kind of guys. And uh, back then, so he was a tailor, he made his own cloth for material. And so they used magnifying lenses back then to help them check the grain and so forth of the material they were making. And so he figured out a way to grind glass so that it could magnify things much, much, much more strongly, much more powerfully than you could with a typical magnifying glass that they used back in the 1600s. So once he did this, he started looking at all sorts of different things. And um, he noticed that there were, he noticed the first microorganisms. In 1674, he reported the first protozoans, those are single cell microorganisms that are in the eukaryotic cell category. Um, and then he noticed bacteria in 1676. He didn't call them that, but he, um, we realize now that that's what he was looking at. And that's pretty amazing, 1676, because bacteria are very small. So even if you were on campus taking microbiology and using one of our laboratory microscopes, you guys would see that bacteria look like specks, you know, even with modern kind of everyday typical microscopes like you would find in a laboratory. And, uh, and you guys will be seeing that as well on some of the virtual lab activities that you will be doing. Unfortunately, so he reported the information he was finding to the public. Unfortunately, he was very eccentric. Uh, he didn't teach anybody else how to make these early microscopes. And when he died, that technology was lost, and it was the 1800s before people ha figured out how to, how to do this again. So there was a very long period of time um, during which he was the only one who could study these microorganisms, and, and there was a very long period of time that was lost because he didn't train anybody else how to do it. So, and that's an important lesson for science today. You know, if you're a scientist today, you do work, you write up um, journal art, scientific journal articles about it. It gets reviewed by your peers. You know, if you want your work funded, you can't be secretive like this guy was back in the 1600s. All right, so a little bit more about the history. There was a very long debate among scientists that lasted for hundreds of years called the spontaneous generation debate, and this ultimately led to the birth of the scientific method. The scientific method is the process that you use to explain things from a scientific standpoint. Now, not all things that we experience in life can be explained using science. So uh, religious faith, for example, the existence of God, you can't test God scientifically. So not all things fall within the realm of science. But those that do, if you are going to explain something scientifically, then you have to go through this process, the scientific method, in order to do that. Key to the scientific method is objectivity. You try to be objective. You try to keep your personal feelings and emotions out of it. Scientists are human, though, so that can be difficult to do, which is why um, um, in modern science, when you are a scientist and you do research, your work is supposed to get checked and duplicated by other scientists to make sure that you're any conclusions you arrive at are, are really valid conclusions, and uh, you haven't put in, you haven't involved your emotions and your personal biases and so forth in coming to those decisions. All right, so the scientific method always starts, and you may have talked about this in previous classes, it starts with uh, observations about some phenomenon in the world that you're looking at, and if 
causes you to come up with a question that you want to answer. You know, for example, the example I typically bring up at this point, um, you know, back earlier in the 1900s, people were probably noticing that smokers had a tendency to develop lung cancer. So that would lead to a question, does smoking um, tobacco products increase your chance for developing lung cancer? All right, so when you come up with a question like that that you want to explain scientifically, uh, you formulate what's called a hypothesis. So this is your temporary explanation, or it's a temporary statement that has not been proven yet. You've got to test it, so it has to be something testable. So a hypothesis in that case, it can be pretty simple. My hypothesis is uh, cigarette smoking increases the risk for developing lung cancer. You know, something pretty straightforward like that. All right, so a hypothesis has to be testable. Just because you come up with that idea, it doesn't mean it's true. As humans, sometimes we jump to conclusions and think that our hypotheses are true without testing, but if you're going to explain something scientifically, you've got to go through this process. And so that means your hypothesis has to be tested through experiments, um, so in, in an experiment here uh, doesn't necessarily have to be like you're in the laboratory manipulating something. It can mean collecting data and analyzing that data. You know, for example, probably back when the hypothesis first came forward that cigarette smoking leads to lung cancer, no doubt people were collecting data about smokers and non-smokers to see if more smokers developed lung cancer than those who did not. And so that's a way of analyzing your data, collecting data that would support the hypothesis. Another type of experiment that they probably did back then was to expose poor little lab mice and so forth to lots and lots of cigarette smoke, and then they checked them to see if, if they were developing lung cancer. So that would be another type of experiment that you could do. All right, so when you do an experiment, you have to make observations about your experiments, and you try to keep your personal biases and emotions out of it. So you're looking at the results. What does this mean? You interpret it. You figure out whether your data support the hypothesis or not. Um, if your data support the hypothesis, then you can accept it. But notice this line over here. You can't, your hypothesis is not confirmed by doing just one experiment. You've got to repeat the experiment, come up with other experiments to do. Other scientists need to do the experiments as well to confirm them. Once you have a really well-established scientific explanation, that becomes what we call a scientific theory or a scientific law. And I mentioned theory before. There's this common misconception out there that a scientific theory is like a personal opinion because that's how we use that word in everyday lingo. That's not true. A scientific theory is one that has been very well tested. There's a lot of data around to back it up. Now that doesn't mean that theory can't be altered down the road, but nevertheless it is a, a very strongly supported scientific explanation. Uh, in biology we don't have laws. There are laws in, um, in physics, for example, like you may have heard of the laws of thermodynamics before, like energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Those are scientific laws and uh, which aren't going to change. They're kind of just basic principles on which certain scientific areas you know, are, are built. And um, theories, so in biology, we, we stick with theories because they're constantly changing and being modified and we're learning more about them. All right, now what if your uh, experimental data do not support your hypothesis? Uh, you can reject your hypothesis or you know, stomp your feet, have a fit, go, go have a drink, try to feel better about it. Uh, more likely, though, you're going to modify your hypothesis. You're going to say, okay, that explanation wasn't right, so let me change it a little bit. And then you go back over here and you start back over. And that's kind of the reality of, of scientific research. But again, if you are going to explain something scientifically, you're supposed to go through this objective process, trying to keep your personal opinions and emotions out of it and you have to do testing. You have to collect data and analyze that data and make sure it supports your explanation. All right, so a little bit more about this
idea. I said this, uh, the theory of spontaneous generation is what ultimately led to the development of the scientific method. And this is a pretty recent development. You know, people didn't explain things in this way until, uh, until not too long ago. But spontaneous generation, what does that mean? Um, another term for that is abiogenesis. And it, it means um, living matter spontaneously arising from non-living matter. Okay, so living coming from non-living. That's abiogenesis. And then other scientists at that time had a uh, hypothesis of biogenesis, so any living thing is coming from a previously living thing through reproduction. So there were these two competing hypotheses as the plural term for hypothesis. So a little bit about some of the history there. Um, there were a series of experiments that were done over a period of a couple of hundred years that kind of led to a back and forth about this topic. There was an Italian physician named Francesco Reddy, and he did the experiment that you see down down here. So people back uh, in the 1600s, you know, you put garbage out and they noticed that maggots appeared on rotting meat. Now today we know that maggots are an immature stage of a fly. So flies lay eggs, the eggs hatch into the maggots, and then the maggots transform eventually into the flies. Kind of like a caterpillar to a cocoon to a butterfly type of thing. But people back in the 1600s didn't know that. And so uh, Francesco Reddy set up this experiment that you see here. So he had pieces of meat in these glass flasks, jars essentially. And if he put a piece of meat in a jar and left it open so it had access to flies, he noticed that maggots appeared on the meat. And that's what people had observed for a long period of time. And they felt like, oh, well, these maggots are spontaneously appearing from this non-living, this dead meat tissue. Um, then he noticed if he put a piece of meat in a jar and covered it with a cork, then the, um, I'm sorry, then there no spontaneous generation occurred, okay? So nothing occurred here on the, on the meat. And finally he did another uh, experiment where he covered, he put a piece of meat in a jar and put a piece of gauze on the top of it and notice that maggots would eventually appear on the gauze. And so that let him know that, um, that let him know that the flies, he saw the flies landing on the gauze and that let him know, okay, these maggots are probably coming from the flies and they're just attracted to the, the smell of the meat. The maggots aren't developing from this dead meat tissue there in the jar. Okay, so that, led to the idea that, okay, spontaneous generation of life does not occur. Abiogenesis does not occur. Uh, these maggots are coming from the flies which are already living, and that supports the idea of biogenesis. All right, but maggots and flies, we can see those with the naked eye. Remember that, uh, meanwhile, Antony van Leeuwenhoek had discovered microorganisms. So the debate continued. People said, okay, so living things that we can see with the naked eye don't spontaneously generate, but what about microorganisms? There was a guy, an uh, English guy named John Needham in the 1700s. He noticed that he could boil beef gravy and plant infusions. A plant infusion would be like if you took leaves, like tea leaves, and combine them with water and let it steep. That's going to be a plant infusion. So tea is a type of plant infusion. I guess technically coffee would be as well. But he noticed that um, even if he boiled these things, so you think that's going to kill any microorganisms that would be present in there. Um, but after it cooled down and sat around for a while, he noticed that these things turned cloudy. And uh, that indicated that there were microorganisms growing in there. So he was saying, hey, look, um, microorganisms do spontaneously generate. They're just appearing in this gravy and these plant infusions even after I've boiled them. All right, then an Italian guy in 1799 said, now wait a minute, you're leaving these things out in the open. Um, well, no wonder microorganisms are growing in there. Maybe they're coming in from the, they're coming in from the air. So Lazaro Spallanzani said, look, if you seal the flasks after you boil them, you're not going to get any microorganisms growing in there. Okay. 
And that was the case. If you boiled the gravy, boiled the plant infusions and kept it covered, nothing grew in there. All right, but then people criticized him and said, well, you're not letting any air into the vials. Of course, the microorganisms can't grow in there. There's no air supply. So finally, Louis Pasteur, a very uh, famous scientist and one who's considered to be the father of microbiology, he conducted the definitive experiment that answered the question once and for all, even with microorganisms. Uh, and he used specially designed swan-necked flasks to answer the question. So the problem here was nobody could figure out how to uh, set this experiment up so that anything that might be in the air would not have access to the boiled liquids, but then also you want to maintain the air supply. So that's where this swan neck flask came in. So he was putting broths in a swan neck flask and boiling them to kill any microorganisms that might already be in there. And then this flask had a swan neck on it. So air can still get in there. There's still an air supply. So that uh, overrode that, con that criticism of the previous experiments. But then also anything in the air, and if there were any microorganisms in the air, they would get trapped down in here. A lot of times microorganisms are on dust particles. If any dust comes in here, it's just going to settle down in that crook. Microorganisms don't fly, so they're not going to swoop up here and come in here and land in the and land in the liquid. So he showed he could boil these broths and leave them in that type of flask for a very long period of time and no cloudiness ever occurred. There, were, there was no microbe growth. And again, that's because they were getting trapped over here in that crook of the flask. And he showed if he broke the swan neck and now allowed any microbes in the air to have access to that fluid, that fluid would turn cloudy. So again, this is back in the 1800s when this happened, and people had not really put two and two together yet that there were little uh, invisible microorganisms in the air all around us all the time, and uh, Pasteur helped show that. So that finally answered the question. Uh, there's no spontaneous generation of life. All uh, life forms on the planet today come from previously existing living things. Living things do not appear from non-living matter, and that in includes uh, microorganisms and organisms that we can see with, uh, with the naked eye. All right, in the next video lecture, we're going to move into the part of chapter one, which uh, t talks a little bit more about cells and how they're organized and the types of large organic molecules that they're built from. And I will, um, you know, I encourage you to read over those sections in your textbook. I know that uh, some students come into microbiology not having heard about proteins and carbohydrates and lipids and nucleic acids before some of the basic chemistry info. Um, others have a pretty good foundation in that from their anatomy and physiology or introductory biology classes. So um, you're going to have to kind of gauge where you are and read on Blackboard because I do have some additional extra optional chemistry background video clips that you can work through if you feel like you need to catch up on your chemistry background. So like if you're taking this as your first science class, you definitely need to do that extra chemistry work. Or if when you took anatomy and physiology, your instructor didn't really mention or discuss any of the background chemi chemistry info in your A&P textbook, then you probably are going to need to do some of that um, extra material that I have posted for you on, on Blackboard. But anyway, next video lecture we'll pick up here where we'll talk about cellular organization and macromolecules.